Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, good morning, or wherever this finds you. Um, and welcome to our panel today. First, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the Middle East Institute, especially Mohammed and the team, for their willingness to host this timely event uh, for the ICSC and for all of us. And thanks for everybody working behind the scenes, and of course, the panelists and the audience. I'm Claire Dalton from the International Committee of the Red Cross, and I'm going to give some opening remarks before we go to our panel. A quarter of the world's population currently faces extreme high water stress each year, according to a report by the World Resources Institute. This is, you know, a really startling statistic. This means that countries are using up almost all the water they have. By 2050, 1 billion people are expected to be affected. And we're talking here about this region I'm sitting in today uh, in the Middle East. And it's not all, it's not the only issue that we face. The Middle East could also see an overall warming up of five degrees Celsius or nine degrees Fahrenheit if you're uh, over in Washington and the rest of the US. You know, this is really significant and this could take place before the end of the century. So these are very pressing challenges we face. In this region, we've just had a summer, you know, with heat waves calling shutdown, causing shutdowns. We've had rolling blackouts during these hot summer months. The higher temperatures have real life consequences. And, you know, we're gonna hear about these from our uh, experienced panelists. However, we've seen things like forest fires in Syria, unprecedented temperatures in Aden, in Yemen, and in Basra, in Iraq. They're startling statistics. And maybe they're not surprising. And they're only part of the equation. The International Committee of the Red Cross works in places affected by war and conflict. So we're particularly concerned with what happens when these issues overlap with armed conflict. This means they compound each other's impacts and end up making the humanitarian needs across the region even more difficult. Indeed, throughout our operations, throughout the Middle East, we witness this convergence of climate risk, environmental degradation, and armed conflict. And we see how it threatens people's lives and livelihoods, how it impacts health, and worsens food, economic, and water insecurity. There are many ways that this convergence can translate to soil and land degradation. And it can hamper agricultural productivity and food security. These are very real issues for people every day. Air quality has declined throughout the region. You know, there are a lot of reports right now on the impact of poor air quality. This has an impact on health. Also, the increasing scarcity of fresh water is its own major public health challenge. And if you've got half of this region's population living in water stressed areas, indeed, it was recently reported, I think it was the New York Times, that the Middle East is getting hotter. And therefore, this has an even bigger impact. I mean, I, we've got a colleague here from Iraq, but I think it's what I think it's the fifth most vulnerable country to extreme temperatures, water scarcity, and food shortages. However, this country has also endured many armed conflicts that have far reaching impact on people's lives. And so what I'm trying to say again, is this compounded impact of both climate change and the impact of, of conflict. You know, in, in, in Yemen, fresh water or the scarcity of fresh water can be a key driver in the spread of waterborne diseases. Again, this compounds with issues such as wastewater pollution, this is possibly a likely contributor to the cholera outbreak we saw in 2016 to 2019. We're also seeing, you know, rivers, the levels going down, which restricts drinking water, again, leading to higher impact of waterborne diseases. But of course, water is also needed for hydroelectric power and also irrigation for agriculture. So again, these things are all interlinked and they have a negative impact in many, many different ways. And really what matters a lot to, to us is the way these impacts are felt in the most extreme ways by people affected by armed conflict. You know, it's an acute vulnerability you face during an armed conflict, 
and also countries often severely impacted by their capacity to respond to people's needs. And so when you put the impact we're talking about via climate change on top of this, we really need to ensure that these communities are prioritized for climate action. In practice, they are among the most neglected when it comes to climate action and finance. And this is what I think we're gonna be talking about more today. There's been a lot of progress towards recognizing this challenge, but much more needs to be done to address it. Strong climate action and climate finance are needed in these places. It's critical to do this to reduce humanitarian need and preserve development gains and also in, avoid the systemic breakdown of some of these essential services, be that you know, water, energy, or agriculture. Now, my most important kind of, I would say learning observation is that addressing these challenges is not something that humanitarians or humanitarian action can do alone. You know, one of the reasons we host this event together with the Middle East Institute is to highlight the necessity of collective action. You know, we humanitarians, but development actors, climate scientists, policy makers, you know, people in government with influence, we can all work better together. We can share our expertise. We can learn from each other as well as mobilize and convince others to come on board. You know, this is the opportunity that the COP28, which will be held in the UAE, uh, where I am later this year. And I know we've got experts to talk about that. And we've got a real opportunity to bring fragility and conflict into the climate discussion. And already we've seen a lot of increasing steps to try integrate this and to address this in the conference. And I know Chris will be speaking about that in more detail. Um, for the ICSC, we have a lot of hope for the COP28. Um, and I think there's three things that are really important for us. First is that the international community recommit to urgent and ambitious political action to reduce emissions and keep warming within a habitable range to avoid the worst consequences of climate change on people. Easy to say, you know, we know it's hard to do. Um, and this is why we need that the international community also acknowledge the high vulnerability of countries who are enduring climate risk due to their limited adaptive capacity. And I think, you know, people will speak about that too. Finally, we really need that the international community lives up to its commitments to bolster climate action in countries vulnerable to climate change and ensure that climate action is strengthened and supported by fit for purpose, accessible finance in countries enduring conflict and violence. Again, this is an, you know, not that difficult to say, it's a long sentence. However, it is hard to achieve and that's why collective action is so necessary. I think we all know this is difficult work but it's also essential, if not existential, because of the cost of inaction. It will only increase the pressure, both on the vulnerable communities, but on all of us who are trying our best to respond. You know, without adequate responses for some of these value, vulnerable people and communities in the Middle East, the humanitarian impact will only rise and the crisis is, will persist. And this has a cost for everybody. It has a cost for the people. It has a cost for the organizations and governments trying to respond and you know it has a cost for our for our common goals to see an improvement in these areas so you know i thank you for listening i didn't want to say too much because we've got a lot of experts ready to talk um, i'm very pleased to sort of turn to megan our moderator today you know she in her own right has plenty to offer as well um she's the executive director i've just got to read this so i get it right um, of the Society of Environmental Journalists. And so she's no stranger to examining this intersection of climate change and conflict. So thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate this. And thank you to everybody again for allowing us to talk to you about this really, really pressing and important issue. Thank you so much, Claire, for that uh... A wonderful introduction to the issues um, and to our panel. And thank you to ICRC and the Middle East Institute for bringing us to get together this morning, or at least this morning here in DC and this evening in other parts of the world, um, for what, as Claire said, is a, a very difficult issue, but essential and existential. So I'm very much looking forward to learning from our panelists. Um, first, as Claire said, I'm Megan Parker. I'm the Executive Director of the Society of Environmental journalists, which is North America's largest 
Membership Association for Journalists that Cover Energy and Environment. But before I joined SEJ in 2018, I worked for 15 years at the Woodrow Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program, um, where I uh, focused uh, on uh, the con these uh, connections between environment, health, peace, and conflict. So I'm really excited to uh, learn today more about uh, the situation uh, in the Middle East and the plans ahead uh, for uh, COP28. Um, I'm gonna introduce our panelists, ask them a couple of questions, uh, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. So please start thinking about your questions, uh, put them in the Q&A, it's the box down at the bottom of the screen, uh, early and often. Um, so that we can be sure to um, uh, ask them of the panelists uh, during this conversation. Um, so I'm going to start with Haider Alabadi, um, who is based in Iraq. He is the Climate and Environment Officer for ICRC in their Baghdad office. So Haider, uh, we know in Iraq that climate-driven water scarcity is a significant problem and it's getting worse. Um, how are the climate impacts and water scarcity connected to conflict in Iraq and what are you seeing on the ground and especially how is that playing out as Iraq shifts to a post-conflict setting? Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everybody. Um, first of all, uh, you know, talking about the country known uh, um, since ancient times as the Mesopotamia, the land of the two rivers or the land between two rivers. Iraq has a rich agriculture identity, with uh, farming being a long-standing provision and significant part of Iraq culture throughout history. The humanitarian, the humanitarian impact of climate change on Iraq is severe, as its affect agriculture, livelihood, and access to clean drinking water. According to the Iraqi Minister of Agriculture, half of the arable lands are unused due to the water scarcity, extreme weather, events such as the frequent sandstorms and the floods can lead to loss of lives and displacement. Iraq is already facing a significant increase in internal displacement induced by climate change. According to the IOM report, about 14,000 families have been displaced since 2018 due to the climate change impact. People who are working on agriculture relocate to search for a place that have better access to water resources, putting more strain on the host community's resources. Climate change can increase tension among the communities over the scarce resources, and this is a very common problem in Iraq. According to the studies and reports, the two rivers will vanish in less than 30 years from now if we don't take the needed actions. That's it, the situation in Iraq. Thank you. And, and how is that um, affecting the uh, instability in the country? What are the connections that you're seeing between these environmental impacts and um, the uh, conflict situation? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know that, uh, as I mentioned now, there is uh, some kind of displacement, internal displacement. And now, uh, not only from now, but even from the past that we are witness some kind of uh, some kind of conflict between the tribes uh, before their resources. Uh, also, uh, as you know, that uh, uh, there is some kind of, of problems uh, across the country, across the borders between the, uh, the Iraq and the other uh, uh, countries who they are, you know, uh, the, the upstream countries who are there holding the, the, the water uh, resource and the water sources of, for Iraq. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna turn to Megan uh, next to talk about Syria. I, I'm not sure if she's um, stepped away. Oh, there she is, great. Hi, Megan. Um, so Megan Ferrando is a non-resident scholar in the Climate and Water Program at the Middle East Institute. And Megan, you're, you're an, I know, an expert on Syria. How are these connections playing out in that country? And um, what are the consequences you're seeing of uh, water scarcity uh, on the conflict dynamics in the region? Uh, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, thanks. I have to change my, uh, my sound. Um, okay, well, I a lot of what Hader has said uh, at the moment, a lot, of, a lot of the themes I think are are quite common, are, are really common between the two contexts. Um, but I think, let me just frame a little bit of what the situation in Syria is at the moment, because uh, it's the civil war is still going on, has been going on for 12 years. 
but uh, it's much less on the uh, in in the public view at the moment. Um, so, at the moment in Syria, of the 22 million people who are living there, there's uh, 15 million people who are in need of humanitarian aid, uh, and that number is, number is actually uh, higher than what it was last year. Uh, and then you need to take into account that 12 million people are food insecure, uh, that over 5 million people are displaced within the country. Um, and um, within that, that Syria is, I mean, the civil war in Syria uh, for the 12 years that has been going on is not a sort of, is not a homogenous uh, context. So there's some areas that are controlled by the Syrian government, by Bashar al-Assad. Uh, there's some areas that are controlled by uh, opposition groups. And in those areas, there's particular uh, particular violence still going on on a daily basis. Uh, and there's some areas that are un under control of Kurdish forces. Uh, there's Turkish uh, Turkish forces that are present in Syria. So the, the mapping of what conflict means is completely different from one region to the other. And so I think that's an important thing. I think that's an important part to visualize when we say, okay, so what's, what is the link between climate and conflict or with water and conflict is what does climate mean in particular? And so in Syria, for example, um, it means if we, if we take access to water, it means that um, over the past 10 years, 40%, uh, uh, Syria has lost on average 40% of its access to, to water. That is, because of violent conflict, because um, because of the destruction of water networks, so water pumping stations, um, both intentionally and unintentionally. Uh, it is also because, uh, I mean, what Claire and Hader have mentioned as well, is really the, econo the economic consequences of, um, of being in this context of conflict. So there's been 12 years of conflict, 12 years of bit by bit eroding uh, the economy and people's ability to cope with shocks. So in terms of water, for example, you see that uh, the uh, economy, is, economy has crumbled, prices, prices have risen, uh, it's, it's led to a uh, fuel crisis, which has led to an electricity crisis across the country, electricity being essential for the well functioning of public services, like the water network, it has even further impeded people's access to, uh, to water. And then add to that the, the additional layer of uh, of droughts that we've been seeing for the past three years. The past three summers have been some uh, some of the worst droughts in the in say Syria's history. Which I mean, same as in Iraq, it's a very uh, very strongly agriculture based economy. Uh, so it's had a very strong impact both on people's jobs and on people's uh, food security. And so as you see, like that, it's. Um, the conflict and climate interact or conflict and environment interact in the sense that there's both um, sudden shocks because of violent conflicts, but it's also really structural shocks or structural erosion of, um, of people's resilience because of the length of the conflicts. And on top of that, climate shocks or weather, weather related conditions such as floods, such as, uh, such as droughts that are, that are putting even more pressure on people. Um, and uh, so I say, as also for the for the water resources, people have a lot of people across Syria have now um, so been being faced with water shortages, which has forced them to turn to alternative sources of water to get to get their drinking water or their the water for for irrigation, um, which in itself then has led to huge challenges when it comes to water quality. Um, the lowering of water water quantity means that there's a higher concentration of of pollutants of toxic uh, um, of toxic materials of harmful bacteria in the water, and that's also one of the one of the factors that has contributed to uh, the rise in the spread of the cholera epidemic, which uh, started in Syria in September now now exactly a year ago, and which is still going on. So I yeah I think that kind of shows that every every time um, both conflicts and climate. Uh, add this uh, add this layer of stress on people who are already in a vulnerable position, and the longer it the longer conflict takes, the more uh, the more it erodes this uh, this um, uh, this resilience. Great, thank you so much, Megan. Um, 
turning to Mohammed Mahmoud, who is the senior fellow in the and the director of the Climate and Water Program at the Middle East Institute, um, we've heard about Iraq and Syria. Um, I wanted, wondered if you could tell us, uh, are you seeing similar connections playing out across the region? Um, and you know how? Uh, what are these? You know both these these the first and second order effects. You know of the interrelationship uh, between um, climate and conflict um, in the Middle East context. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Megan. Um, it's it's complicated in the sense that I think the easiest thing, I guess, first of all, I'd say yes. There's certainly at a first level similarities across the board in the region in terms of impacts to climate change um, because the region is already naturally prone to being dry and arid uh, for the most part and i mean if you eliminate sort of the northern and southern extremes of the region where you start to see change in in uh, topography and, and geography the region is sort of a desert dry desert uh, warm climate uh, across the board going east to west uh, one of the consequences of that is you don't get a lot of, of rain, a lot of precipitation naturally. So for, for much of the region, um, sort of natural evaporation far exceeds uh, the amount of rain that comes comes down. So just off the bat, without the overlay of climate change, the region is already uh, more prone to experience drought in terms of, of its water resources. But now you add that overlay of climate change, uh, both in all types of water sources. So the few the few countries that are blessed to have surface rivers and systems, they're not very prevalent throughout the region. Um, their headwaters are experiencing reduced generation of water supply because of, of climate change. Um, and then again, stresses those rivers and systems in terms of meeting uh, water needs downstream across the countries that, that they pass through. Certainly, Haida was talking about uh, you know, the land of two rivers. I mean, Iraq is also quite dependent on the Tigris-Euphrates system. So, uh, so is Syria. Um, and, you know, the headwaters are in Turkey. And so all those countries are affected. Um, similarly, in the Nile, if you look, uh, you know, Egypt all the way upstream, Egypt, Sudan, and further north. Um, but also, when we, if we're looking at the water side of things, groundwater. I mean, uh, prior to hu humanity and civilization in the region being able to uh, uh, learn to dam rivers and create reservoirs and, uh, and, and utilize the surface systems they've had, the region has traditionally and still uh, use, utilizes groundwater. Um, but that over-reliance comes with a cost. Uh, and, and, and there's, there's negative consequences of, of over the overuse of groundwater. Uh, but in more recent times, and I'd say, you know, over the more recent decades, uh, the region out of, honestly, I'd say need and, and to some level desperation, I think is amplifying because of climate change have shifted uh, towards desalination. Uh, those that have been able to do so, uh, coastal communities with which most of the region uh, has access to coast, not every country, but most. Uh, as a way to boost uh, their water supply, because either their their surface water systems are constrained, uh, their groundwater is already being heavily relied on. Uh, but if they have access to the coast, uh, they will utilize desalination. In fact, for a large portion of the region, certainly if you look at the Arabian Peninsula, uh, those countries' water supply portfolio is predominantly from desalination. Um, to, to help meet their supplies. Um, and then there's other consequences, right? Extreme weather is affecting uh, sort of the stability uh, of, of infrastructure and safety um, because of warming of the oceans. We're seeing an amplification over the last few years. We've seen amplifications of cyclones hitting, uh, you know, places like Oman and Yemen and sometimes even traveling all the way to the Horn of Africa. Uh, and, and even if you don't look at the most extreme of extreme weather cyclones, uh, just an uptick, at least in that portion, uh, of heavy thunderstorm precipitation events. I mean, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, had these crazy uh, winds and storms uh, in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca. There's, you've seen these videos of, of just things flying around and, and the thunder and lightning and, and and it's it's crazy to think of that in, in a in a in a in a first level sense. You think that could be a good thing because it's a dry region, so rain is good. 
yes, but not that level of, of rain and intensity that that draws uh, a, a negative consequences. So definitely there's there's um, that first level impact is is consistent somewhat across the board. But to your, to your second point of your question is what are the secondary impacts? Um, and, and that is dependent now that becomes more dependent on the countries themselves. And that is also contingent on their ability to be resilient uh, in terms to these impacts. And that's that's unfortunately when you see in the region sort of uh, the countries, the haves and have nots, right? Those that have the uh, either financial resources or capacity to be able or capability to be able to respond and deal with these secondary impacts. So if your water is compromised, that affects your ability to grow food, right? Because water meets more than drinking water needs and residential needs, but also um, ability to grow food, ability to support energy production, ability to support manufacturing. So now your secondary effects are going to bleed into the economy. And a lot of the countries in the region, as was mentioned by my panel, my fellow panelists, uh, is, is facing economic hardship. Much of the world is really. And so you're adding that overlay uh, of it's not just an environmental natural impact, but now it's combining with economic conditions, conflict, exacerbating uh, humanitarian issues already on the ground. Um, so the second order impacts are amplifying, uh, in a sense, existing conditions and hardships, whether it's issues of conflict, issues of the economy, issues of food security, obviously water security somewhat linked to the first tier. Um, and then just, uh, now starts to affect uh, or propel issues of migration. If people are compromised in terms of their ability to sustain a livelihood due to conflict and climate change, you start to see these shifts in, you know, across the region or out of the region. And so, you know, we can, I'll, I'll, I won't go too much into that quite yet. I think that's going to be part of our broader discussion, but, uh, but certainly to, to get, to get to the, to the root of the question, um, the first impacts of the things we talk about a lot because those are easy to quantify. We see those outcomes, but the second order, uh, I think that's that's where things get a little bit complicated in terms of how they manifest. And then, you know, I guess maybe later in our discussion, we'll talk about uh, sort of how do the strategies, right? The adaptation strategies on, on how you deal with that. Thank you so much, uh, Mohammed, for that. It certainly is um, complicated that word has come up now multiple times and we are lucky to have a lot of time to dig into that. We're also lucky to be joined today by Christopher Frasetto, who is the Senior Advisor for Partnerships for COP28, which is coming up at the end of November uh, in the UAE. Um, this is a top priority for this topic is a top priority for the UAE presidency, which is great to see, especially after so many years of, of, of being relegated to, to side events. Um, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that it's going to get um, some uh, high level focus. So can you let us, uh, fill us in, you know, why now and, and how will these issues be taken up at a COP? Great. Thanks, Megan. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thanks very much, Megan, and thanks, uh, of course, to MEI and ICRC for having me here today. Um, so we, we've heard a little bit already about some of the issues um, driving this uh, this focus. And to be honest, it's it's very much what we heard um, in a in a year of consultations when we were designing the thematic program of the presidency, and even before COP twenty eight. Um, these issues, of course, were present. Uh, in you know uh, on the sidelines of previous COPs and and in work streams across uh, the international system. So, based on this, um, and based on of course, I, I think um, uh, the UAE's commitment to these issues and the Security Council and elsewhere, um, we listened a lot to what we heard from partners and in the presidency program, which will have multiple thematic days. Uh, we will feature the first ever COP day devoted to relief, recovery, and peace. This will be on December 3rd. Uh, and it's actually the first thematic day of the entire thematic program. Uh, and, and really what we're trying to do here is to bring formal attention to and new resources to uh, highly climate vulnerable settings um, that face both barriers uh, and opportunities from scaling up urgent climate action um, because of a perceived risk around fragility or, or conflict, for example. Um, the ambition here is, is really to bring together climate 
development, humanitarian, financial, peace sectors into solutions oriented responses that sort of move beyond the advocacy element, but there'll be quite a bit of that there as well, uh, and into sort of practical ways of, of cooperating um, to address these issues. There'll be a lot of cross-cutting themes um, on Relief Recovery Peace Day, and the specific uh, case of conflict-affected countries will be one of them, because of course, um, responses for a conflict state are, are very different, of course, than from a state experiencing fragility. If you look at, you know, for example, the definitions the World Bank uses, Asian Development Bank uses, for example. Um, but also, um, we want to ensure that frontline communities are invested in the decision making and design of responses as well, uh, which is really important, I think, to our to our day. Um, there will be other sort of event streams uh, and focuses on Relief Recovery Peace Day, including early action, early warning. But I want to really zero in on the um, the today's topic, which is about accelerating adaptation uh, efforts programming. So we're looking at this um, from sort of three main boxes or pillars, so to speak. Um, the first one is finance, um, not only existing, but but new elements of finance. And this is everything from access to absorption capacity to distribution and monitoring. Um, how do we ensure that some of these places um, who may not even be accredited to climate funds in the first place have the systems in place to, uh, to receive uh, either, either financial support or programmatic uh, support? Um, the second pillar or box is knowledge and practice. So this is about scaling up action in fragile contexts or conflict-affected con contexts. We know that there are programs and outcomes and uh, collaborations that work already. Maybe they're not at scale. Maybe they're only run by humanitarian actors because there's an absence of other actors in the space. So how do we, how do we basically build on both experience but also evidence base to to scale these programs effectively. Um, that's that's sort of bucket two. Um, bucket three is collaboration. So how do we take what I've just talked about um, numbers one and two and, and really create um, a platform or a mechanism or assistance where that really links together all of the actors that are necessary to make this happen? We, you know, and this includes um, donors international organizations, um, implementing partners, local partners, uh, and recipients. So we're trying to design a program that is, uh, is focused around these, but also um, is, is based around uh, a sort of solutions package where uh, countries, organizations, other actors can come either together or individually with, with, with pledges, commitments, other activities that can can help realize this issue. Um, I think I'll stop there for now. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, um, Christopher. And I wanted, um, picking up on, on uh, the solutions that you were talking about, um, I wanted to ask uh, Hadir if he could explain, um, talk a little bit about you know, how adaptation and, and action in Iraq is, can help address um, these intersections. Yes, thank you, Megan. First of all, I just want to highlight that the ICRC is not an organization specialized in the climate change. We just want to, just want, don't want to, you know, to hide the expectation of the, of the local authorities and also for the other organizations. Just want to like, highlight this. But we recognize that the climate change affects everyone, including those who have like, suffered uh, the harmful impact of the wars. Over the, de the decades of uh, our focus, it's uh, mitigate and prevent uh, the effect of the climate change on the vulnerable population who have been impacted by horrible wars of the past. Uh, we understand that the uh, consequences of the climate change cannot be ignored, and we are committed to address 
uh, this this uh, impact and uh, due, uh, within the scope of our humanitarian humanitarian mission. Our goal in general is to minimize the impact of the climate change on those who have suffered dramatically due to a conflict and offer support and assistance to their uh, in their recovery and resilience building efforts. Uh, both our specific mandate and the scale of the climate change uh, impact in Iraq make us possibly one of the smallest player in this field in Iraq. Therefore, our approach is to play the role of the facilitator rather than significant actor so that the various Red Cross and Red Cross and components present in Iraq can work in harmony putting the IRCS in the center as the first responder for the climate change uh, uh, disaster in Iraq. Uh, in doing so, we will remain informed of the government policies and orientation in this field. The, the letter has also been uh, paying utmost attention in this urgent matter. So there is a lot of uh, governmental efforts in this regard. Indeed, Iraq is already one of the water stress country uh, in the region, and we must ensure that uh, population affected by the, com uh, the, by the combined impact of the conflict and the climate change and environmental degradation have received the uh, support that they are need. Thus, in our program, we promote different approaches. Uh, for example, for these approaches, we support the vulnerable communities when I say community, or vulnerable communities, I mean that the returnees or families of missing or people with the special need in reestablishing re livelihood as it's the very important for, uh, uh, for people that are affected by the climate change and especially in the rural areas, we promoted the adoption of more efficient irrigation techniques to reduce water consumption. Uh, we rec recently supported a retained family in Salah Din, which is a, a governorate in central Iraq, with the, a new solar power sprinkle system that will allow uh, to reduce the water consumption by about 50% of irrigation compared to the traditional flood irrigation system that it's used uh, since the Sumerians' time. Uh, this project uh, is meant uh, as a demonstration project for the neighboring community. Similarly, in areas of Anbar, we have distributed drip irrigation system for female headed households to help them to reestablish uh, vegetable production. Another big area, another big area of work is in the reestablishing water supply services in area most affected by the conflict after the conflict for sure. But uh, instead of just focusing on the rehabilitating the pumping station and uh, uh, the, 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 the infrastructure in general, uh, we are focusing on making it more efficient. Thus, along with rehabilitating the damaged water infrastructure, we work on reducing loses by installing the water meters in distribution networks and providing water leakage detection technology to the authority and building the, the maintenance staff capacity and conducting several water consumption awareness campaign and rehabilitating the damaged infrastructure in general, especially in Mosul city as one of the most affected uh, cities in Iraq uh, by the armed conflict. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, it is, um, I think uh, uh, you called uh, ICRC acting as, acting as the first responder. And I think that is a, 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 a great way to, to look at the role of humanitarian organizations. Um, Megan, I wanted to ask you similarly in Syria, um, uh, what uh, kinds of solutions or actions do you think would, would be helpful? I know the conflict is at a different stage. And so are there different kinds of responses that would be more productive? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the issue you rightly, very rightly point is that uh, climate adaptation is is realistically just not a priority at the moment in Syria. The conflict is really overshadowing everything, um, and uh, I think that I mean there there is an issue of political prioritization um, of well secure, security priorities will be uh, will be put first. Um, but also in terms of uh, in terms of the practical reality of adaptation projects, doesn't mean it, sh it shouldn't be done and that it isn't done on a small scale. But it, there is a very big difficulty when it comes to conflict contexts, uh, in the sense that climate adaptation in general or climate actors, um, 
work work better and are better aligned with, for example, development actors in uh, contexts that are at least relatively stable. Because uh, you because in order to have climate adaptation function well and properly, you need to be able to think in a longer term. Uh, ideally, at some point, you will need to you need to work with uh, with government actors, with authorities. It's really about just like with development. It's really about gradually changing a society, structurally uh, changing a society. The problem is in conflict contexts is that the situation is so volatile. Um, that it makes it very difficult for for uh, for organizations to work together on that. Working through the government is, can so sometimes be very tricky because the government can often be part a party to the conflict, so that also brings brings up a lot of challenges with it. Um, and um, and so that means that there's uh, and and also I mean on the donor level, uh, it's in Syria we see that uh, I mean. Humanitarian uh, funding in general is decreasing, but uh, at least for humanitarian aid, for humanitarian assistance, there is funding because because that has sort of a short life cycle and that works. You can you know that you can have uh, you know that you can have results of uh, of uh, of the investment. Well, if you think about climate adaptation, it's uh, this the risk aversion that uh, that donors have in conflict context because of volatility makes it very difficult to put in place. So as I said, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, at least me from a humanitarian perspective, um, I think that a lot uh, can be done at least on a more local level in partnering with other types of organizations, at least, at least getting the conversation going, at least reaching out to climate, to climate-based organizations and saying, what are you doing uh, as humanitarians or as peace builders? There's much, much more, uh, we're much more used to having access in in difficult uh, in difficult contexts, and uh, and there's so there's so much need for, for example, data for research. So there there's much that can be done, but because of these completely different ways of workings of timelines, we and we we don't really take end because of a lack of funding in general, a lack of flexibility in the funding. Um, it makes it difficult for, for these different organizations to work together, at least when I'm speaking about the, the Syrian context. But that's why I'm very, actually very, uh, I think it's very positive that uh, uh, that Christopher was talking about the, the COP21 initiative. Uh, if that's, if for example, flexible, more flexible funding and more types of partnerships on a local level can be promoted, I think that would be great. Thank you, Megan. And Mohammed, a similar similar question to you, but about the region as a whole. Um, you know, where are you know the uh, the most productive opportunities for climate adaptation and, and action? Yeah, I was actually um, <clears throat> I was going to jump in, but uh, I didn't want to get ahead of the question you were going to ask me, which was exactly what I wanted to say to piggy piggyback off Megan's point. Um, the way I view the approach to to climate adaptation in general, right, is you have to weigh, uh, like any any project uh, project development and implementation. There's issues of cost, issues of impact, sort of return on investment in terms of the project doing what it's supposed to do in terms of addressing a uh, climate impact issue, and, and that's just the general uh, 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 general aspect you have to uh, consider. But what makes, but when we look at the overlay of uh, of trying to implement climate adaptation in areas that have conflict, much to what Megan was was speaking to, um, the calculus gets a little bit more uh, complex uh, for a lot of the reasons that she stated. And in a general sense, you would, uh, looking at this sort of more um, more analytically. When you're looking at climate adaptation projects, you know you tend to, in my opinion, tend to categorize them broadly into three areas in terms of what what you would approach to implement and why. And so, at the at the more extreme end, I call uh, call some of these strategies being conditional, meaning that they're meant to address one particular specific uh, uh, climate impact or climate effect uh, that um, uh, that is sort of very high risk but also could be on, on more of the extreme end of a climate impact that if you built or implement this particular climate adaptation uh, strategy or plan, there's a risk of overinvestment. 
um, where you've invested too much because cost is an issue, right? So cost will always be an issue in terms of implementation. On the other extreme, uh, you have what I call no regrets and low regrets. So no regrets are strategies that you can implement that maybe have low cost of implementation. Uh, they're meant to address a climate, uh, climate impact. But even if the climate impact uh, doesn't manifest as frequently, because things are happening, impacts are, are definitely amplifying uh, or not in, as to the level as intended, there's still a benefit of implementing that strategy. And so, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about examples in a second. Uh, and then the low regrets are similarly things or, stra or strategies, adaptation strategies, which tend to be more easier to implement, more obvious, maybe have a lower cost, uh, but there the risk is of underinvestment. Uh, in, in terms of you not doing enough of it or implementing enough of it to address the issue at hand. So what do I mean by all of those? So when we think of, let's say, climate adaptation strategies that are uh, involve some type of infrastructure development or improvement, right? Haida was talking about uh, uh, improvements to uh, agricultural water use to improve uh, agricultural water use efficiency. There are multiple ways, uh, uh, strategies you can do that as a consequence of, of addressing the drought that's propelled by climate change. So if it's looking at shifting to, as Haida mentioned, drip irrigation versus flood irrigation, to me, that seems like a no regret or a low regret. It's, it's, there's a benefit regardless of drought or not. Uh, you know, Using less water, uh, there's a benefit there to shift the water use to other sectors. So that, that's an easy one. Uh, not easy to do, but easy to identify as, as a lower grid versus a, a something that's more uh, involved. But now if you start to talk about large scale infrastructure improvement in terms of conveying water, whether in residential or between uh, agricultural, uh, agricultural you know, farms or irrigation districts, that requires a lot of investment. Um, and the issue there is the idea is you want to reduce your water loss as you transmit water from source to, to utilization. But then there's a couple of risks. Um, it costs a lot of money. Um, so uh, there's the risk of the cost element, and that requires, uh, you know, trying to find the donors, trying to build the infrastructure, trying to, you know, the timeline is, is, is expanded. But the more important issue in areas of conflict is there's the risk of losing that development because of conflict. You know, we've, we've seen in conflict areas, the weaponization of water uh, and water infrastructure where, you know, dams were used as a means uh, between factions, uh, a controlling flow of, of streams and rivers uh, as, a, as weaponized as part of conflicts or destroying dams and, and water infrastructure uh, um, um, uh, uh, assets. And so, then you've lost the ability to, to benefit from that adaptation strategy using that particular example. And a lot of cost is, is lost. And in some cases you cannot recoup it because of the conflict amplifying or things continuing to be volatile. You can't even salvage that project to continue to do that because of the great risk um, uh, to, to both uh, the peoples that are uh, suffering that impact and then others that would come in to, uh, to rebuild. Um, and so there are issues of how do you how do you implement adaptation strategies in general because of cost and timing and what's effective versus what is not. And sometimes that's not very clear to get your return on investment in terms of it addressing the climate impact you, you would like it to address. But then there is no guarantee of maintaining those uh, uh, adaptation strategies, whether they're uh, actual uh, uh, infrastructure development or practices because of the threat of, of conflict. And I'll just add one other point uh, to consider when we think about, uh, about adaptation strategies in the region and specifically for uh, more so for, for those that are uh, under, under conflict is there's also the risk of solving a problem today, but creating a larger one tomorrow. Uh, and the big example I can think of not big, but the one that comes to mind is this issue of groundwater uh, that we raised, where because of maybe to mitigate the cost of building new desalination plants or expanding on desalination plants or looking at other ways to boost water supply, reverting more so on groundwater is could be an easy fix, right, in terms of it's available, 
we may reach limits of the amount of water that we can draw. So you know, we can drill deeper. I mean, there, there's ways to circumvent. But the bigger issue tomorrow is now two things. For example, you have now exhausted a water supply uh, that uh, you could have tried to maintain through replenishment uh, uh, further into the future. And now you have structural stability issues when we think of things like subsidence. Uh, when you pump a lot of that groundwater, you're, a lot of that uh, soil and earth could potentially collapse in areas that uh, may have had historically larger groundwater reserves and, and compromise that. And then it could amplify things like if there are areas that are potentially prone to, say, earthquakes, what we saw in Syria and Iraq, uh, the earthquake uh, that happened a little while ago. Um, it isn't the cause, certainly, but now could amplify that and now we've you've made a, a, a and if it occurs an, inev an inevitable humanitarian crisis even worse uh, because there's the risk of further uh, structural collapse and, and things of that nature so uh, i didn't directly answer your question i just thought considerations of what are the strategies but we, we can talk more specifically about that if we have time as far as the strategies but things to think about thank you definitely a lot to think about I wanted to ask Christopher, um, uh, you know, listening to, to all of this and, and knowing, um, learning more about your work, clearly, you know, this is a, requires a multi-sectoral approach that requires partnerships and collaborations, but we live in a very sectoral world, you know, with expertise and particularly funding being siloed, you know, what um, kinds of tools or, or assistance or projects is, does, uh, you know, the COP uh, contemplating or, or they, you know, or, or even outside of the COP, you know, beyond that, um, could, could assist, you know, as these different actors come together uh, to try to collaborate around this complicated nexus? Sure, thanks so much for the question. Um, it's super important and, and, and honestly, um, Part of our objective is, is, is kind of socializing this agenda on some of the main uh, stepping stones along the way to, to COP itself, whether that's the Africa Climate Summit, which will be taking place in just a few days, uh, whether it's a high level week at the UN General Assembly at the end of September, whether it's a regional climate weeks. So there's a lot of points here where we can sort of focus energy commitment discussions uh, around some of the pillars that I identified. I, I should also, I think, really make the point that everything I talked about is not part of the formal negotiation program, which you know is is obviously restricted to to the climate negotiators. Everything I spoke about is in the action agenda of COP, which is the presidency program of all of, all of the thematic days. So what this means, I think, in in practice, is that um, the events I spoke about and, and some of the other initiatives on Relief Recovery Peace Day are are going to be in the in the the blue zones and and the green zones, um, which for the first time this year are actually going to be contiguous uh, as well. I don't know if if anyone's ever been to COP before, but um, it has been difficult um, to move between the two in the past. Or as a result, uh, people may may not have traveled over to to the other zone and uh, to see the events and programs and collaborations. So we're trying to make it. Um, you know, uh, accessible, but also we're trying to emphasize that this is very much a partnership initiative. So some of the um, some of the the products that we're going to debut are very much based around creating coalitions of commitments and understanding that this is not simply the presidency sort of dictating what what needs to happen. It's it's very much a bottom up approach that's going to require buy in from multilateral development banks, from international organizations, from the private sector. Um, there's really no uh, element to this work that that won't be necessary, I think, in order to create some of the systemic shifts that we're we're interested in. And, and you know, ultimately, this is about, um, you know, de-risking, I think, adaptation investment, uh, whether that's from a financial perspective or from a programmatic perspective. And there's a lot of things that need to happen uh, as as a result, you know, to, to achieve this. And, and it's really not something that's limited to a single sector. So, I mean, I think stay tuned for some of the announcements of, of uh, the program itself for Relief Recovery Peace Day. But also, um, you know, we know that this topic is beyond uh, our focus. And there's a lot of actors that have been working on this for many years and, you know, have, have ambitions to bring it to maybe to climate pavilions at COP itself, or maybe building on some of the initiatives that were announced in previous COPs. So, so an objective of ours is really to also align 
these other work streams and ambitions um, with the presidency. So it's uh, you know it's an open agenda. It's uh, it's very much focused on building partnerships and coalitions. Um, I thought I saw loss and damage in the questions, and um, it's an important point um, that I didn't make in the in the beginning. And of course, there there's a negotiated aspect of loss and damage, which is operationalizing the loss and damage fund and will be part of the, the sort of negotiated outcome of COP. But it's not to say that loss and damage initiatives won't or cannot or will not be represented at um, Relief Recovery Peace Day as well. And this is where sort of the partnership aspect comes in. Uh, how do we bring together actors that can approach this, whether it's from the, the program design perspective, the insurance perspective, um, Global Shield already created um, uh, in the past is, is a great example of an initiative that's that's looking at loss and damage from sort of an insurance perspective. Um, so the bottom line really is that, um, you know, we're only less than 100 days away, um, but there's still a lot of time uh, for organizations, agencies, donors, um, local actors, et cetera, to think about um, how they want to participate on this day, what sort of um, elements they want to highlight what sort of commitments they can make and, and, and what kind of coalitions we can put together um, on the three pillars I outlined. Thanks very much. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, Megan, did you want to jump in on that? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I just wouldn't, wanted to ask you actually, Christopher, if you don't, if you wouldn't mind, because would the, um, as far as you know, for now at COP28, will, uh, for example, really flexible finance, uh, the development of flexible instruments, uh, that taking into account climate uh, within conflict context, will that also be on the table? Because from me, a sort of in implementation partner perspective, those are those are practically the this practically what's needed actually. And I know that more on the on the on the on the global level, there have been discussions on on how to uh, how to merge uh, climate and security and on the UN level with the climate security mechanism, NATO is working on it, EU is working on it. And but at the moment it's at least for the past four or five years for now, it's really been about um, trying to understand even how the two fields work on a conceptual level. Do you think it would we would be at a stage now to uh to have really outputs in terms of financing mechanisms? Well it's a tricky um question so I and I don't want to prejudge any um you know uh, announcements or 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 coalitions or or sort of commitments that that might happen at <laughs> COP but but certainly um I, I think there's they're bringing uh, an element of uh fragile or conflict sensitivity to some of the main climate funds or having um, a more sort of uh risk tolerance approach um to disbursement uh, and funding and and programming is 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 one of our objectives. Um, we spoke a lot about certain countries too. I mean, obviously, LDCs are prioritized for adaptation under the under the Paris Agreement. Um, but there's also other countries who may not be in the LDC um, definition. That's least developed countries, um, middle and lower middle income countries that face many similar risks that that may also benefit from these programs as well. So we're looking at these kind of things as well. Um, the number one thing that we don't want to do is really to, and this is not an objective, is is, um, is give the sense that we're creating some sort of other category of, of state. It's really not what, we're, what our objective is. Our objective is more around equity in existing finance or, or in new initiatives. So if you look at it from the perspective of equity and not about, say, prioritizing one country over another, um, th this is how we want to see it. Yes, there are there's areas where this sort of investment is severely lacking. And from an equity perspective, um, we're, we're looking at ways to try to adjust this. Thank you all. We um, have uh, said, had such a, a really lively and rich conversation. Uh, and thank you so much for uh, all your detailed answers to my questions. Now we're going to take some questions from the audience, which also has provided a lot of, um, of, of issues we can dive into. 
I'm going to start with a question about where are the um, conflict hotspots that are caused by water shortages? We've discussed a couple here um, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, another um, uh, question uh, came in about what about Yemen? So, uh, and, and where, where are others in, in the region? I'll throw that to maybe to Mohammed. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, you think, you think uh, you know, three years of doing this, we'd, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'd figure out to remember to unmute. Um, I have a particular perspective and others may agree or disagree and, and I'm sure Megan and others can jump on this, but to me, I don't, I don't necessarily look at um, conflict hotspots necessarily created by water shortages, but I definitely see the role that uh, water shortages can do to amplify and make conditions worse where conflict and humanitarian issues uh, are happening. Um, and, you know, we've already talked about a few examples, I think, uh, when, we, when uh, Megan mentioned Syria in terms of uh, sort of the dire need that that folks are resorting to uh, uh, because of either rising cost of, of services, water, or in rural communities that don't have access to uh, uh, traditional water transmission systems in urban areas, uh, folks resorting to getting water on their own, uh, in some cases straight from uh, tributaries and streams of, of those rivers that, that are in proximity. Uh, but the risk, of course, there is uh, folks that do that uh, are accessing water uh, that is, in a sense, raw uh, and untreated. And so drinking that water uh, without proper water treatment is causing these outbreaks of, of waterborne illnesses, uh, cholera and so forth. So, so that is amplifying uh, issues there. And then, of course... If you want to, I'll, I'll lump in this idea of other places as well, you know, the conflict that's happening in Sudan, a country that's historically had issues in terms of uh, consistent uh, energy and water supply. Water cuts and energy cuts have been the norm for decades, but now uh, it's it's uh, the populations that are trapped within, uh, within the war zone of, of these warring factions are struggling uh, to access food and water, not access, to acquire food and water because uh, public services are now intermittent. And now it's, it's creating this really severe humanitarian crisis uh, in, in, in Sudan uh, and, and Yemen when conflict was raging similarly. So uh, to me, it's, it's not yet a driver of conflict. Uh, you know, there's uh, historically, uh, you know, myself and co other colleagues in, in the field have looked at this and Historically, there hasn't been a war amongst between nations that was uh, rooted because of water. Uh, of course, if you look at historical times, you know, uh, factions or, or groups or tribes of, of people and settlements have warred to access to resources and water, but countries have not gone to war yet. And I hope it stays that way simply because uh, of water issues, but they absolutely amplify uh, existing conflict and existing humanitarian crises. Other folks want to comment on that one? Um, I'll just be very quick, but to say that I completely agree with uh, with uh, Mohammed, because if even if you look now at the at the crisis, at the conflict in Syria, um, there's been a lot of thinking. Oh, even the, the are the causes of the civil war? Is it due? Was it due to to climate change or to water shortages? Um, and I think at the moment, what we'll, what we see whenever uh, whenever there's a causal link between uh, climate and conflict, it's because it's mediated by other factors, by economic factors, political factors, social dynamics, marginal marginalization. So it's um, saying really, are there water, are, are there conflict hotspots caused by water? I tend to agree with uh, with Mohammed. And also in, I mean, now in the north of Syria, there is, uh, they're facing a very, very acute water water crisis as well. It's It's been leading to tensions at the local level, but um, I'd say it's a bit of a stretch to then say, this is going to feed into the, the main dynamics of the conflict because it's, it's so much bigger than that. 
Thank you. Um, we got a couple of questions about Iraq that I'm going to um, throw to Hadir and I think Claire as well um, can weigh in. Um, one is a question about um, are there any efforts to monitor the groundwater response to the irrigation efficiency efforts going on in Iraq? Uh, curious about whether the effort towards sustainability has yielded positive results for water conservation. And then another question asking about so, uh, solutions targeting um, the problem of the drying marshes in southern Iraq. So, hey, dear and Claire? Yes. Claire, you want to interfere? Sorry. Yes, uh, for the first question, actually, uh, for the, uh, the, the boreholes and the underground water, we have like several studies about the, um, you know, about the impact of the climate change on the, on the water uh, um, level in the boreholes. And I, can, I just want to give you one example that's uh, in a city called Tel Afar and the Sinjar, which is located in the north of Iraq, there is a high demand of water there and there is no river passing by the uh, Sinjar city. So they are depending mainly on the on the boreholes. I visited the city and uh, I asked the uh, department who are they are responsible for the underground water, what is their plan for, you know, to cover the, the high demand of water and what is their strategy for the future? So they say that if we have like high demand of water, we will dig more uh, boreholes to cover the needs of the water. And then I said that what if the aquifer level will go down? So they said we are going to go deeper and deeper uh, until we find the water to to take it out to for the for the community. The problem here in Iraq that we are facing is that uh, we have a lack of 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 uh, uh, let's say strategies. Uh, we have a lack of of management of water management. Uh, um, uh, they don't look to uh, and uh, like uh, they look to pro problem to to provide an intermediate solution, not long-term solutions. Uh, mainly they are focusing on the short-term solutions. So uh, for sure, we have some studies about the impact uh, of the uh, irrigation system, but for sure, they we found in the agriculture, uh, uh, Minister of Agriculture, that the drip irrigation system and sprinkles uh, uh, system is better than the flood way of, 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 uh, of uh, irrigation, because we have here in Iraq a high evaporation ratio, because we have very high hot weather. So uh, uh, this is what I uh, understand from the Minister of Agriculture so far, but uh, for sure that I will try to check more about what you mentioned about uh, uh, that the efficiency of, of, this, uh, of this technology. Uh, this is for the first question. Sorry, the Megan, what's about the second question? Um, about the marshes in Southern Iraq and any yeah. solutions for those. Yes, yes, we, the, the Minister of Water Resources, they are established some committee call it like a committee of uh, uh, re-establishing or supporting the uh, Martians in Iraq in the South. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, they have very, uh, you know, uh, small actions in this regard because they are facing a very, uh, you know, uh, the water scarcity, it's, it's hitting the South severely. So uh, they have some actions. Uh, they, you know, they delegate some of uh, officials to Turkey in order to increase the Iraqi water share. Uh, to pump it or to send it to the marshlands in the, in the south. But uh, for now, we have uh, some different comi uh, comi uh, committees. Also, there is a committees, a committee will participate in the COP28 uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the negotiation uh, with the upstream countries in order to increase the Iraqi share of water for this purpose and for the other purposes as well. Um Claire, if you wanted to add anything, let me know. My mistake. I didn't mean to answer a question oh. on Iraq. I feel Haida is much more experienced than me. But I did see a question that's interesting about, yeah, I mean, you know, should we really be putting humanitarian money uh, into some of these challenges? And I think that's a very important question because obviously, yes, we know humanitarian needs are rising and often there are difficulty to, to meet appeals and humanitarian needs in general. I just say, I think what's important here, it's not to take, you know, money away from, say, adaptation for countries that need it. It's just more also that humanitarians need to think more about how to ensure their own operations are sustainable, do no harm to the environment, and take into account the double vulnerability that climate and conflict brings so that they can help people adapt to this adaptation. 
So indeed, I think it's very clear that obviously, yes, humanitarians cannot invest massively in a lot of these programs and nor are they the best place to do so. I think many people have highlighted that. However, what humanitarian organizations can do is ensure their own programs are fit for purpose and indeed make you know, it slightly easier, if you can say that, for some of these people and communities to manage these associated risks. So I think that's important. And I think Chris spoke to that too. We're very aware, obviously, there's a lot of important needs that different countries face. And it's not all about conflict or fragile affected countries. So, you know, we're, we're also trying to say, we're just talking about this specific area and the need, you know, not just for others, but for ourselves as humanitarian organizations to work better in uh, climate and conflict affected uh, places because of this vulnerability. So I'll just add that, but I'm sorry, I can't add anything better than what Haida has already said on, on Iraq. Great, thank you so much. Mohammed. we have a couple of questions for you. Um, one is, um, uh, are you seeing any saltwater intrusion in coastal areas? And um, also, what, talk some more about desalinization. Um, what are the impacts on uh, marine life or other environmental consequences of, of that um, solution? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so actually, this, this is a timely question. I'm working on a, on a um, research project on preserving the environmental value of the waters of the Gulf uh, in the Arabian Peninsula surrounding uh, the Gulf waters. So, um, so my response is mostly contingent on that water body, but I think there, there are some similarities in, in other water bodies surrounding the region, either the Red Sea or the Mediterranean. Uh, but research, because uh, this was a prevalent question in terms of preserving the environmental value of the Gulf, is what's the impact of, of the desalination? There's a lot of it's a lot of desal plants along the coast there. Similarly, uh, in the Mediterranean as well, and a smaller extent on the Red Sea. But what we found, based on the research, is that uh, in terms of increasing the salinity of the water body, at least in the Gulf, uh, all this desal activity has not uh, caused an uptick, really, of, of salinity in, in that water body. And there's reasons, there's actually logical reasons why that is. Um, it's a water body that's, water bodies tend to move both on surface current and deep, deep water current, so the water is not static. Uh, so as the brine discharge is released back into uh, into the into the water bodies, in this case, into the Gulf, there's a lot of mixing that's happening, both uh, water within that confined area, as well as water moving in and out, um, out, of, out of the inlet of the Gulf itself. Um, Mediterranean Sea is even more wide open, Red Sea is a little bit constrained, but more, um, at least more open than the Gulf. Uh, so the research studies so far to date have just looking back for the decades since desal has been active, uh, there hasn't been an uptick in the salinity. Now, I, the, the, the caveat or, or the, the, the thing to consider even saying that is this is looking short mid term. Um, there, have there have been studies in terms of slight upticks of salinity close to the point of discharge of brine from the desal process, but that's expected. But in terms of affecting the large scale salinity of the water body and in turn then affecting potential marine life and terrestrial life, we haven't seen, the research hasn't, hasn't supported that. Um, uh, I would argue at this current stage, a greater threat is the warming of the oceans because of climate change affecting, you know, increase the, the really stark increase in the temperature of the water it does affect coral reef bleaching does affect the ability of fish species to thrive and populate and 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 spawn uh, because temperatures are warmer than certain fish species can survive and then as those particular fish species decline that's a food source for other marine life and so i think at the moment and certainly moving forward with the amplification of climate change the warming of the waters is more of a threat uh, uh, than the salinity because of just how uh, uh, ocean currents move and, and cause a lot of that mixing so that the concentrations aren't, aren't uh, very, uh, very intense in that regard. In terms of groundwater intrusion, um, from what I've been able to see in the research uh, from my end, uh, hasn't been a lot of large scale groundwater intrusion, uh, in, uh, sorry, saltwater intrusion into groundwater that's probably close to the coast. 
But that could also rapidly change, uh, not rapidly, but eventually change because of climate change. Warming of the waters is causing an increase in sea level rise. And of course, sea level rise is, is rather slow in terms of an impact and occurs over uh, decades, uh, and in some cases, centuries. And different areas may see that sooner rather than later in terms of large scale sea level rise. But the risk there is, of course, now uh, uh, as sea level is rising, as you're pumping groundwater, that may be aquifers that are close to the coast, those now could be compromised because of, of saltwater intrusion. But uh, we haven't seen anything large scale yet uh, uh, on that. But but both could potentially be compromised, uh, both uh, groundwater aquifers that are close to the coast, marine life, primarily because of climate change, not, not yet we see because of, of desalination. Thank you so much. Um, Christopher, a couple of questions for you. First, um, specifically, um, what is needed for the uh, GCC countries to partner to help the more, more vulnerable countries in the region? Um, how, what, you know, efforts uh, are needed to um, uh, get to work together on, on these connections? And then broadening out to look um, at, uh, at the globe as a whole, you know, what about um, the role of mitigation? We talked a lot about adaptation today. Um, you know, how do we, uh, uh, what are some um, opportunities for the big emitters, um, you know, like China and the US? Um, and of course, you know, also um, some of the, you know, the countries in the Middle East um, to uh, help on the mitigation side. Sure, I'll take the second one first. Thanks a lot. I mean, without I'm not, you know, I'm not going to prejudge the 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 role of negotiations and outcome at at COP. This is this is a very different focus than um, the partnerships team and, and the action agenda. But obviously, mitigation is hugely important. Without mitigation, nothing uh, that we've just discussed, um, we, you know, it will will ultimately work without serious investment on the mitigation side. I mean, obviously adaptation, there's been a criticism that it has been underrepresented versus mitigation efforts. But at the same time, I think obviously the commitments that uh, were set out in Paris and beyond are, are, are key factors in, in terms of, of mitigation and commitments from, from emitters included. Um, how can the GCC get involved? I mean, you know, for us in the action agenda on relief, recovery, peace day, this this is an open book. You know, I mean, we're we're hoping to have as many countries, actors, whether they're donors, whether they're affected states, whether they're um, multilateral banks, international organizations, um, sign on to some of the commitments that we're putting forward and, and some of the products that we're going to be putting forward. Saying, you know, here's how I can assist. You know, whether it's uh, maybe elevating a regional initiative that works. Uh, or, or, or taking a, a separate regional initiative and 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 uh, sort of uh, you know scaling it or or taking best practices. This is a sort of knowledge practice aspect of 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 what I was getting at in the the second pillar of our work. Um, listening to you know partners, you know m many of which are are here today, like what's already working on the ground, you know, like, how do we scale this? Like, this is where, where countries that have capacity come in to this equation. And, and this is part of what we're, we're bringing together, I think, in terms of collaboration, obviously, there's a donor focus. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, some donors maybe are more interested in a specific region or others, but, but I think that we're looking to leverage sort of solutions and, and activities that work that might be able to be replicated elsewhere. Um, or we you know we also have to realize that a one size fits all approach isn't reality either. You know, like maybe we need to uh, look very specifically in context. You know, maybe the solution in Yemen is very, very different from what the solution in Iraq, for example. Um, and how do we activate sort of regional partners here to address that sort of context specificity? But also, I think it's a matter of. Um, allowing states that maybe don't have the institutions or maybe don't have the absorption capacity, how, how do we get them, e even if there were willing providers, I think, of, of financial material or programmatic support, how do we ensure that um, the government or the group um, is able to leverage that, whether to implement it or absorb it or has the mechanisms set up um, to receive the financing? That's a huge part of this equation as well. Um, Great. Maybe I'll hand over to to Hyder as well. 
Thanks very much. Yes, Hi. Megan. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that uh, to what uh, uh, Clara mentioned uh, previously about uh, um, the we are working in uh, an, as a humanitarian organization to just to make sure that our operation are, are sustainable and do we trying to to reduce our footprint. But besides that, uh, in Iraq actually we have another approach. Uh, besides that, what what's all mentioned there that we are you know supporting the uh, the Iraqi Red Crescent and other local organization uh, as they are uh, an essential. Uh, and uh, responding to the need uh, that come out from uh, the climate change impact. So uh, we believe that they are very important in designing a local solution, in particular, uh, the disaster uh, risk management mandate of the Iraqi Red Crescent uh, defined them as the first responder. So thus we are supporting the IRCS in uh, uh, you know, improving their emergency response uh, capabilities uh, to climate climate risk. Uh, actually, we have uh, a couple of, of projects that we are working with the, with the IRCS in the southern Iraq, uh, responding to the uh, water scarcity and the uh, uh, humanitarian impact of the climate change. For example, we are supporting the IRCS uh, uh, to respond to the water scarcity in the southern area in Iraq. Uh, and as you know, may know that uh, traditionally water treatment units in the south relied on the rivers or the open uh, irrigation channels as the source but currently uh, the level of uh, the two rivers uh, are reducing and the irrigation channels are often left dry. The only other uh, water source uh, is the shallow and uh, generally very salty groundwater. Thus, uh, uh, to respond to the change in context, the Iraqi Red Crescent has installed a small re reverse osmosis units to, to serve uh, the rural communities more impacted by the water scarcity. ICRC uh, support the IRCS with the new installation of uh, uh, these systems, and uh, we work on strengthening the, their capacity in operating and maintaining the installed RO units. Uh, also, we paid. Uh, we we just uh, try to make this treatment economically visible and less environmentally impacting by installing solar power system as alternative source of power uh, for for uh, this uh, units. Our efforts also uh, focus on improving movement coordination to support IRCS, which will enhance the outreach and effectiveness of the movement response to the impact of the climate change Iraq. Uh, we closely coordinate with the Iraqi government. Uh, we have very close uh, relation with the with the other uh, governmental entities uh, in this regard, who they are working in the climate change. And it is very important uh, uh, to know what is their intention and what is their actions. And also, uh, we are participating in all the uh, events that related to the climate change. You know what's the uh, what the other are doing in this regard for all the mitigation and adaptation actions in Iraq. That, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Haiti. Um, Megan, there's a couple of questions um, in your way. Um, where or how do you draw the line between humanitarian priority needs and risks to address and resilience? Um, lack of funding is a serious issue. This has come up a couple of times already. Um, and a related um, question about um, what efforts are being made to better um, uh, find evidence for the humanitarian consequences of climate change in the reasons uh, in the region? Uh, meaning, you know, what uh, where is the some of the data gaps and and some of the efforts to um, collect that information? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, the my answers to the two are very very much linked, and they they also build on what uh, Haider and uh, and Claire were talking about. Um, I think it's a very fair point that uh, the, there's a very difficult tension between immediate humanitarian, humanitarian need and then longer term uh, uh, longer term adaptation, for example. If you look at Syria, we have this dilemma of, okay, um, we could stop pumping groundwater at this particular location because we see that uh, it's... Uh, uh, it's going to be a, a very, a very big risk in the coming years. But we have a couple of million people here that are internally displaced and that are reliant on the water today. So there's this, especially in conflict. I mean, it, this is this is a 
the the now versus the later is a dilemma that we're asking ourselves in relation to climate change in every country in every context but in conflicts the um the urgency of the now takes even take, takes even more priority so that makes it very difficult and uh and also very fair point that there's a there's a lack, a lack of uh available the right type of funding for it um which is also why i was asking was asking and wondering about more uh, more targeted and more flexible instruments, funding instruments. Um, but uh, I think what uh, what is interesting is, for example, with the, with the, the projects that Haider was talking about in Iraq of really being uh, a coordinator or a facilitator, or um, I mean, this linking them to the second question of there is lack of data, uh, linking and partnering with uh, as humanitarian human, humanitarian organization, for example, really linking and partnering with uh, organizations that are more focused on data in northeast Syria at the moment, there is uh, it's one of the one of the hotspots when it comes to the water crisis in Syria. Um, the the next steps are really going to be how can we map all the boreholes and all the water levels throughout throughout the region because it will it will then impact and it will then inform. Uh, what we can do and where we should where we should invest in our efforts and what, what areas we should absolutely uh, leave uh, leave aside. So I think these partnerships, at the very least, on information management and on research and on data, is is a good entry point and is quite is quite doable. Thank you, Megan. Claire, um, real quick point on local solutions to add. I just wanted to highlight, I think it's very important that we all do listen indeed to local people and the communities facing these threats as to what they also see as the solutions and we design them together. I think that's been mentioned by a few of us, but that is really key. And the COP also offers that opportunity uh, for people to come together and, and, you know, explore some of these ideas. And I think equally, you know, there was a question on the GCC. I mean, obviously there are also perhaps other alternatives, new technologies, solutions, that can be brought uh, to some of these questions. And so indeed, I really think it's important on this collective action point that as humanitarians, we listen to what people believe can be good solutions for them in their context. And equally other countries who perhaps have new technologies or ways that they can uh, help countries adapt to some of these challenges or indeed make sure our operational responses are more sustainable and do no harm. I feel this is a very important thing to come together um, on at the COP in November. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, we have had so many wonderful questions. I'm sorry, we're not gonna get to all of them. Um, I do wanna pose one final one as a lightning round as we um, head towards the end of our time together. Um, and uh, so if everybody could just very quickly um, say, uh, answer this question. Um, we have been talking about this, meaning collective action, harmonization, alignment around these issues for at least 20 years. What are we, the international community, going to do differently this time? So if there's like one thing that you think, you know, we need to do differently as we look ahead to the COP and to the next 20 years, um, uh, whoever wants to go first. I can jump in. Uh, the, the concern is going glass. Someone will steal my idea. So, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, I think my quick takeaway is the time. No more time is ripe than now uh, to to take action. I mean, the justification for action is all around us. I mean, look at, certainly in the region, but you can argue in other parts of the world. The last couple of years, the points Claire said up front, all the discussion pieces my fellow panelists said in terms of amplification of the wildfires. The summer we had is unprecedented on a global sense. July, the hottest month on record ever. Um, and various local, uh, local and regional uh, records broken in terms of, of temperature thresholds, breaking the global average record uh, three times, setting it, I'm sorry, three times in a span of four days in the beginning of July. Wildfires, the, the dust storm activity. I mean, on and on and on, we're all very much aware of how bad things have gotten in terms of, of, of the impact and effect of climate change. What more justification do we need for action? I think it's there, the momentum is there. We, we know, I feel like there's no, um, the, the, the inertia is gone. There is momentum to capitalize on this to really, hopefully, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm optimistic and hopeful to capitalize on an action, not just the COP28, that's certainly the lightning rod 
or, you know, in front of us that can bring those things together, but moving forward uh, because next summer, next year could be worse in different ways. So we need to capitalize on the fact that we have the world's attention. Everyone is impacted. Everyone has a stake uh, and we can certainly move forward in action towards uh, uh, climate action and climate resilience. Anybody else want to jump in and give their very quick, very quick, uh, one thing we should do differently? Well, sure, I'll, I'll go in. Um, I mean, having having spent a lot of time at UN headquarters, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the sort of all talk, no action uh, point. And I think that, you know, what are we trying to do differently? Um, you know, we have a dedicated day on relief recovery piece at COP28. It's never happened before. Its objective is to be really solutions oriented. It's not an advocacy exercise. So our, our hope is really that by by putting this front and center and by putting it not only front and center, but as the first day of the thematic program of the presidency agenda, we can get high level political commitment, buy in from actors across the spectrum that that not only commit to understanding the issue, but actually come to COP prepared with um, commitments and actions and solutions that we can start implementing immediately. Thanks. Great. Megan or Hadier, any last thoughts? Um, very quickly, a bit of a repetition of what I said before, but to me, uh, actual partnerships, uh, focusing on NGOs implementing partners, just try, <laughs> just try. If pilots, local level pilots, common research, joint advocacy, that's that's just very, very much underdeveloped, even though it's a lot of is low hanging fruit. So to me, it's that. Thanks. Yes, I fully agree with what Mengen mentioned. That is very important to have like an actual and effective uh, partnership with the others. And also, uh, um, I just, you know, carry out the, uh, the, 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 the concerns of the Iraqi government. They just want to, uh, you know, because they are uh, say that, uh, that all every COPs, there is a promises, but there is no actions. So they hope that uh, this COP will come out with, uh, with uh, a strong uh, or an efficient uh, action plan to, to do some actions on the ground. That's it from my side. Thank you so much. And join me in thanking our fantastic panelists for what was uh, proved to be, as I expected, a very, very engaging, rich, and informative discussion. Um, the uh, recording will be available on the Middle East Institute webpage and on YouTube. And uh, I look forward to